Hi guys, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. Today we're gonna to talk about one of my favorite lessons and activities that I've done with my students so far this year. I'm teaching all virtually, so it's been more difficult than usual to get to know my students and get a sense of who they are and what's important to them and what motivates them. And just in general, it's been harder to find ways to build relationships with them. So this fairly quick lesson um, gave me a lot of insight into who my students are and it really built a good foundation for the year as we study English and as we study stories and look at where other people are coming from. Now we have a really strong understanding of what culture is. And this is such an important thing to talk about in your class. I think this is even a really important thing to talk about among your staff and the people that you work with. And so we'll get into all of that in just a minute, but we're gonna talk about how to talk about culture in your class and how to do that in a really productive and affirming way. So before we get into that, I just remembered that I've had this really cool box sitting here for like a month or two. <laughs> I have a stack right here of like things that I keep meaning to talk about in videos and then sometimes something ends up on the bottom and I forget about it. So I haven't actually looked at this one yet, but this is a little Justice Leaders box and they sent this to me a little while ago and I was like, yeah, I'll like post about it on Instagram or something, but I forgot. So let's look at it uh, in this video really quick. And if I remember correctly, this one is all about voting. Yeah, oh, this is cool. You get a little picture and then an explanation. Okay, yeah, so this month our theme is voting rights and voter suppression. You have that here and then on the back, um, instructions and how to use this box. Oh, and this is a sixth through eighth grade teacher box. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I was kind of actually thinking this was maybe for like younger students. I feel like that's what I've seen from them in the past, but that's really cool that this is for sixth through eighth grade teachers. Wow, and there are like 10 lesson ideas for how to use this in your classroom. So this is really, really cool. As I'm posting this, the election is just like a couple of days away. So this stuff could be really, really useful. Uh, you've got some vote stickers. Right here you've got action steps to take as a class as well as additional teaching resources. This is like a little voter card and then it has some information on the back. Oh wow, there's so much in here. Um, conversation starters and then a place for notes on the back. Um, wow, tips for teachers, some tips that may be helpful when covering this topic, and then an organization spotlight on the back. Wow, if you need some resources for how to talk about voting in your class, this box is full of them. Some sidewalk chalk, which, hey, maybe we can use it today, me and Jensen. It's very gloomy outside for the first time in like months. I'm actually very excited about it. It's not great for filming, but I love that it's not super hot outside today. Um, you get a little pin. This one says, let America vote. Oh, hey, okay. We get a bunch more of these. They're like little postcards. Oh, this is very exciting. I think this is literally in my Amazon cart, but I always like put things in my Amazon cart and then try to buy it from a different bookstore, you know? It's just like my reminder of what books I want. But I really like these History Smashers books. I have the one about the Mayflower and it's very good. I'm always a little bit like skeptical, like how are these history books gonna cover certain things, you know, but that one I definitely recommend. So I'm excited to look at this one, Women's Right to Vote. This is cool. There are a lot of like pictures and stuff in here. And the last one that I read had a lot of like primary source documents and then they helped you kind of like break those down. So if this is anything like the last History Smashers book that I read, then even within the book, it offers a lot of tips and resources and stuff for how to teach this. And this has a lot of like notes in the back, long bibliography, that's what I like to see. Amazing, okay, so I'm definitely gonna be reading this, maybe like today. Oh, hey. Look at this awesome poster. Nobody's free until everybody's free. Ooh, I love this. Okay, oh my gosh. And then this is like a whole other set of lesson plans. Oh my goodness. Just like all printed out for you. Wow, okay, this is this is very cool. <laughs> I actually didn't realize it was gonna have so much great stuff in here. This is like 
for sure a lesson plan in a box. Like you just pop that open and you've got a ton of teaching ideas and resources right there. So I will leave a link down below, information about how to get a Little Justice Leaders box. And that's really exciting to me to see one that is targeted more towards sixth through eighth graders. Okay, so let's talk now about culture. The first unit in our textbook for my um, eighth grade English class, we use the HMH collections curriculum, and it's called Culture and Belonging. And so it has a lot of stories from like kids who come from other countries and then come to the United States and are, you know, kind of caught in between these two cultures. There are also quite a few stories by Native American authors, so we go really deep into that kind of in the second half of the unit, but the first half of the unit is more about this tension between um, a culture that maybe your parents hold that is different from the culture in the United States. There's a ton in this unit that we skip. I feel like the goal of the unit is to talk about like the best ways for people to assimilate into American culture and that is not my goal with this unit at all. So there's a lot that we skip and a lot that we add. So a couple of weeks into the unit, we do a brief history of race in the United States, and I have a couple of videos about that. That's a resource that I have on Teachers Pay Teachers. It's very, very basic. It's honestly like not that in-depth, but it's stuff that most people don't know. So we do place a pretty big emphasis on separating race from culture. So when we learn about like the history of whiteness in the United States and what that means and how that creates other racial categories, then we have a fairly good understanding of what race is. And because um, the first couple of stories that we do are from the perspective of Asian Americans and because a lot of my students are also Asian Americans, we go into the concept of the model minority and the argument that that is a myth. This is where like race and culture get a little bit murky because in the United States we've created this racial category of Asians <laughs> when Asia is like a quarter of the Earth's surface area and population and there are dozens of countries within Asia and many many languages, many different cultures, different physical environments, geography, yet in the United States we lump together Asians as the model minority. And among my students I get some resistance to the idea that this is a myth because for some of them, they have seen this model minority stereotype play out in reality. Um, and so it's important for us to like fully explore that and how our different immigration laws and quotas have affected this. And then to also look at people who are refugees. That's what one of our stories is about. There's a girl who is a Hmong refugee from, well, they were in a refugee camp in Thailand. So anyway, people who are refugees tend not to have these, you know, immediate financial, economic stability stories of success because they're starting from a much different place than somebody who came here for their PhD. <laughs> so anyway, um, I definitely find that when you talk about things like race, culture, class, religion, any of those things that people tend to kind of like shy away from. With students, you don't do those things like theoretically. You don't just like talk about it in general. You want to tie it to your curriculum, tie it to a story, tie it to a specific current event that you're talking about, or tie it to a specific historical event that you're talking about. Use it to illuminate and provide understanding about something specific and not just, you know, talk about it in general, that tends to not work very well. So anyways, I created just this single slide, it's just a culture board, and this was in direct response to some of the confusion about the stereotype that Asians are the model minority, and so that's why it says at the top, um, culture is separate from race, but is often, though not always, connected to our family ancestry. It includes the traditions we are intentional about maintaining, and our daily routines that we don't think much about. Choose some elements of your culture to write about on a sticky note. So over on the sides, I've provided quite a few different categories. And I think that's one thing that we get a little bit confused about too with culture is, especially when we're talking about other cultures from our own, because that's what we tend to do, right? When we, when we talk about culture, it tends to be about other like exotic cultures or something like that. And we tend to think of like the really big 
traditional ceremonies or things that like really stand out. But culture is also just the daily routines that we participate in and really don't even think much about. And really that makes up more of our, our culture than we think. So this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just a few categories where um, our own cultures reveal themselves. And with students, I like to give them different options because if I just gave them like eight categories that they had to write about, there would definitely be some where they're like, I can't think of anything. So I allow them to pick the things that they want to write about and like where something immediately comes to mind. And of course, I provide an example of my culture board so that for one, I can just give them an example of how to do it, but I think it's also important for them too to see my reflections on this topic, especially as a white person. So I think early on in my teaching career, I was very enthusiastic about students like really embracing their culture and talking about it, writing about it, you know, connecting it to the curriculum, but I didn't really talk about my own culture that much or even reflect on it very much. And part of that is because, you know, I recognize that everybody already knows white culture <laughs> we're just like surrounded by it but if I can't pinpoint how that directly influences me as an individual and then how my beliefs and actions influence my class then I've really missed something big so on my culture board I really reflected upon how my family and my hometown and my own experiences influenced my culture so for example Let's just talk about a couple of categories. So one that seems kind of innocuous and not like a really big deal is chores. So I literally grew up on a ranch. I grew up in a very rural community. I raised pigs for 4-H. I was the 4-H president. We had horses. I did rodeo. We had a lot of different animals, cows, cats, dogs. All of that so the culture that I come from is very very different from the culture that I live in now and the students that I teach in close proximity to LA these little kind of like suburbs of LA and they tend to be very surprised when I tell them about this so chores were a really really big deal like to my family and to most of the people in our community because it was a community of mostly like blue collar workers, right? So we had this very strong sense of like manual labor <laughs> drilled into us. So I was definitely doing like laundry and dishes and cleaning and mopping and all of those kind of things from maybe like the age of like eight or nine. So to us, like doing chores definitely represents like being responsible, learning the value of hard work, um, you know, we'd get like a allowance from that and you know, that is supposed to like teach you the value of a dollar. And so, you know, uh, these are fairly common like American values, but I kind of grew up thinking that that was like universal. And so that's where you have to just like identify the things about your culture that might not be universal. So anyway, when I first came into the district that I teach in now, I don't really remember why this came up, but um, we were talking about how most of our students don't do chores. That's just not a thing that they do. And because, you know, for like 30 years that had been like ingrained in my mind, like, but how do you become a responsible person if you don't have chores? How do you learn to, you know, <laughs> take care of yourself? How, like, how do you, how do you learn these skills otherwise? Like, don't you become lazy if you don't do chores? Like, that's kind of my internal monologue about chores. And so I think I did kind of start to like project that onto my students. Like, oh, okay, well, are they going to be lazy if they don't do chores? But one of my coworkers was explaining to me, maybe she could like see it in my face, like not computing, like not having to do chores. <laughs> and she explained to me like, a lot of our students, you know, they go to school and then they go to some kind of like an after school language program and then they probably have a sport that they're playing and a musical instrument that they are practicing and they go to those lessons and their schedules are just very, very full. And the way that their parents look at chores is more like your school is your chores. <laughs> like you are definitely doing your homework. You're going to come home and sit down at the table, do that homework, practice piano, practice violin, whatever. And like right now, school is your job. That's how you learn to become responsible. Adults will do the chores. That's not something that we're concerned about right now. Like you need to take school seriously and then, you know, maybe your, your instrument or your sport. So that really made a lot of sense to me. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's that's why they're you know not required to 
wake up early and, and feed the pigs like I was <laughs> when I was their age. <laughs> the cultures were just very, very different. But the idea is the same, you know, still raising kids who are responsible and are working towards some kind of a goal. And really the parents, you know, in our community in general provide a lot more support for their students' education than like-minded or the people <laughs> in my community did. Even though my parents were teachers, <laughs> they didn't really place a ton of emphasis on school. I don't know, I guess just because I like, I was just responsible on my own and I always did my homework, but they never like made me do my homework. They never helped me with my homework. <laughs> there, there wasn't a lot of that happening in my house, but there was definitely an emphasis on, you know, learning to be responsible through physical work. So I just use that example because it's an example of something about my culture, you know, that I thought was positive, but that when I reflected it onto somebody else's culture, it caused me to like judge that culture and not be able to see it clearly. And so then you have to learn a little bit more about that culture and see what the intentions are for that particular action or tradition or habit or whatever. And this is where we can, you know, eliminate the misunderstandings and be able to understand and appreciate each other a lot better, even when we come from different cultures. So I gave a couple other examples on my board about like money, like I was <laughs> reflecting on this the other day too, like it wasn't very common for my family to like haggle about prices or anything. We just didn't really talk about money, like it felt a little uncomfortable to talk about money. And I've noticed that in other cultures, like it's very common to haggle over prices and that's just kind of part of the process and just much more normal, even though that like makes me a little bit uncomfortable. There's so much that you could explore through relationships, like whether or not you see relationships as something that like, you know, you find your soulmate and it's more like a fairy tale or is that something that is more of like a family affair where they are involved in helping you find somebody who would be good for you. And that just all really depends on culture. Um, you could get into things like religion. Some people just really don't have a religion, so that might not be a category that they choose. But anyway, you end up learning a lot about your students and really yourself. And then I think it's also important to recognize that for most of us anyway, especially if we live in, in an area like Southern California that's pretty diverse, we're also impacted by other cultures. So there's a question at the bottom that says, what are some ways that you learn about other cultures? And this might just be through a friend, like you go to a friend's house and they do things a little bit differently. Their parents have a little bit different rules than you have at your house. Or you might like watch a TV show that shows you what a different culture is like, or you might watch somebody on YouTube that does things differently from you, or you might get a chance to travel or host a foreign exchange student that does things in a different way from you. I told them some stories about some foreign exchange students that we had, and even when I went to England, and lived there for a little while and their culture was very different than mine. One time I put tea water in the microwave and my British roommates almost had a heart attack and they yanked it out of the microwave and they said you don't put tea water in the microwave, you put it in this electric kettle over here that I had never seen before. But I learned very quickly that's not how you do things in England. So it's also important here to recognize that culture and race are not the same because I would be, you know, the same race as somebody in England or like most of Europe, but our cultures are not going to be the same. And then you'll notice that among your students too, if you have a diverse class, that there are going to be students who share like maybe the same race category, but their cultures may not be the same, or there may be students who are very different from each other, and then they share some of the same cultural values. There's some overlap there. And I always get this question from teachers who are like, well, what if my whole class is just like white? <laughs> I think this would actually be super interesting in a class of students who are, who are all white because they aren't gonna have the same culture. Some students might go to church every Sunday. Some students might not. Some students' parents might be from like a certain area of the United States where they do something very specific that is different from the way that other students do it. So it just becomes really, really clear through this little exercise that race and culture are not the same and people may have similarities and differences, but it's based on something other than race. So it ends up being really, really interesting. And I think this is also something that would be useful to do as like a staff, as a teaching staff. Maybe teachers could like fill it in on their own time and then at a staff meeting, like 
you know, go into small groups. We're doing everything with breakout rooms, I guess, because we're all virtual, but, um, and just discuss the different cultural values that you come into your classroom with and maybe like what you're expecting from students. And it's really important to recognize these things because, you know, some of us see certain behaviors as like disrespectful, that maybe to that student the intention wasn't disrespect, but, you know, we kind of all interpret like even things like eye contact through a different cultural lens. Like some of us think, you know, if we are talking to a student, they need to be looking at us. Otherwise that's disrespectful. But in some cultures, um, you know, children are taught that like you don't look directly at an adult, like you, you look down and that's more of a respectful way to interact. So it can prevent a lot of misunderstanding if we are just aware of the culture that we are bringing into a classroom and the expectations that we are bringing into the classroom and there's, you know, nothing wrong with that culture that we're bringing in, we just have to recognize that we can't like always impose it on every single other student in our class, especially if they're not even aware that that is the expectation. Because that's the thing about culture is it tends to go unsaid. It's those things that we just assume everybody knows. If you go to an Asian household, they're going to assume you know to take off your shoes before you come inside. But if you were never told that, you might just not know and then you could cause offense. So it's those things that like we think you don't need to say, but you do need to make clear those expectations if there are different cultures within your classroom, which there are, there will always be. No matter how homogenous you think your class is, there will be some differences of culture in your class and among people on your staff. I mean, you can just go into so many different things, like <laughs> just even like the way people converse and problem solve and, you know, some people find like certain ways of doing things confrontational, other people just, you know, find that normal. So there are, we can just avoid so many issues if we are just aware of our own culture and other people's cultures and just take a little bit of time to reflect on those things, express those things, and then get in the habit of kind of like considering others' behavior through that kind of lens. Like, oh, I wonder if they meant to offend me <laughs> or if this is just the way that they do things and they didn't think that maybe that would you know, sound offensive to me or whatever. So I just think this is a good habit to get into with your students, with your coworkers, with anybody. All right, guys, that's all I have to say about this. I have been talking about it for a very long time. <laughs> Let me know if you end up using this and if it is useful in your classroom or if you learn anything interesting that kind of gave you like an aha moment. I hope you're having a great weekend and I will see you next time. Bye.